Uh, well, hi, I'm Dr. Natasha Reynolds, uh, and today I'm having a conversation with uh, Dr. Miram Bendath uh, in a series produced by the Psychotherapy Action Network, a global community of mental health professionals and stakeholders dedicated to promoting psychotherapies of depth, insight, and relationship. Psychotherapy Action Network is a 100% volunteer-run nonprofit, and you can learn more at cyan.org. In this series, we're going to be interviewing and speaking with authors, researchers, academics, and policymakers, many of whom serve as advisors to the Psychotherapy Action Network, and all of whom are concerned about the current state of mental health care policies and practices. We will be hearing uh, what some important voices in our field have to say about the future of psychotherapy. Uh, Dr. Benda is an attorney as well as a psychotherapist and a founder of Psych Appeal. With a background in law, clinical psychology, marriage and family therapy, and psychoanalysis, he serves as a consultant to national mental health advocacy organizations and frequently presents on the access to treatment and mental health parity. He is a member and a, uh, of the American Psychoanalytic Association Committee on the Government Relations and distinguished Edelson consultant to the group of advancement of psychiatry. He lectures and has been interviewed in the press and pu has published widely. Most recently, along with the Coalition for Psychotherapy Parity, he co-authored the Clinical Necessity Guidelines for Psychotherapy, Insurance Medical Necessity, and Utilization Review Protocols and Mental Health Parity. Dr. Bendet has helped patients and providers successfully challenge denials of mental health treatment through administrative appeals and impact litigation, recovering millions of dollars in wrongly withheld benefits. Thank you so much for your time and for meeting with us today. My pleasure. Thank you yeah. for being with me. Yeah. Well, I guess I, I just wanted to get started and hear a little bit about what got you involved in the Psychotherapy Action Network. Uh, well, uh, as a psychotherapist and as a um, person who very much cares about access to treatment, um, I have obviously worked with various groups over the years to advocate for access to psychotherapy and particularly uh, toward meaningful treatment. Um, and and uh, Cyan is one of the very few organizations that has really placed an emphasis on psychotherapy and on depth psychotherapy uh, as being a cornerstone of uh, mental health care. And uh, through the small circles that we all uh, weave through, uh, I became acquainted with the organization and with the leadership and uh, have presented um, and consulted to the org organization since its founding. So um, I would say uh, probably mutual affinities led us to uh, each other. Understood. Well, and, and you mentioned, uh, you know, the Psychotherapy Action Network's ideas about um, relationship and depth and in, in insight in psychotherapy. And I'm just curious, what is your perspective on the place of relationship, depth, and insight in, in the current context? Well, uh, I would say that, that it is imperative to allow for treatment to be meaningful. And we know uh, from research, we know from um, uh, all sorts of evidence, including anecdotal observational studies, that uh, short-term treatments or time-limited treatments uh, may have a very limited utility uh, for a very uh, limited group of people. But uh, the, the um, overwhelming uh, number of patients uh, that we treat and come across have multiple uh, uh, conditions, disorders, um, and, and needs that can best be addressed only through um, the processes accorded by depth psychotherapy, mm -hmm. which includes the psychodynamic and psychoanalytic uh, treatments. So um, I very much um, uh, am a believer that people should have whatever treatment is best suited for them. There is no one size fits all. There's not one treatment that I think is necessarily the be all and end all for everyone. But we live in an era where um, 
in this country, uh, there is a mental health epidemic uh, in large part, uh, nowadays exacerbated by COVID-19. Mm -hmm. And we also live in a climate that's um, uh, highly dependent on uh, reimbursement from managed care. Most people rely on their insurance in order to be able to access treatment of any sort. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's really been the focus of my work to ensure that when people need uh, coverage for their mental health care and try to access it from uh, or through their insurance companies that they are accorded uh, a meaningful um, uh, uh, opportunity to engage in treatment and yeah. not just pawned off to uh, the most short-term, uh, uh, least um, uh, kind of uh, consistent forms of therapy that have a very limited role uh, for, um, again, a limited segment of the population. Yeah. So uh, regrettably, we live in an era where um, healthcare coverage, insurance, uh, all of that is, is uh, managed by for-profit corporations that really have given um, uh, short, um, uh, short shrift to, to uh, these types of, of treatments that, that revolve around depth and that um, provide patients with the maximal opportunity to recover and engage in um, uh, meaningful use of their lives. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, Toward, towards healing, I think, too. Um, I guess I, uh, I'm curious, you have such a unique, uh, his, you have such a unique background in, in your profession. You're both a lawyer and a psychotherapist. And can you tell us a little bit about what brought you to both fields? Sure, well, um, I first, started um, uh, my professional uh, life in, in, in law. Okay. Uh, and I uh, represented children and families in the largest uh, child welfare system in the country, which is mm. the Los Angeles um, uh, child welfare system. And so uh, over the course of time, uh, I came across uh, the various stakeholders that that uh, children and families intersect with when they are in um, or part of the um, child welfare system, and that obviously includes the mental health care delivery systems. Um, I worked obviously in the um, system that's part of an enormous bureaucracy, and I was able to see many of the inefficiencies um, of, of the bureaucracy. Um, the the um, consequences of not being able to access care for uh, clients who needed it um, in order to deal with terrible life circumstances. Um, all of that was something that I, I was able to experience as a child advocate. Um, I also had uh, the, the good fortune of uh, taking um, being exposed to uh, aspects of civil and criminal mental health law as a law student uh, at USC, uh, where I had uh, uh, Ellen Sachs as a law professor for a number of years. And Dr. Sachs has obviously been um, a monumental force in um, exposing um, the stigma around mental health um, disorders and bringing a voice of, of awareness and consciousness to our society so that we can more effectively deal with um, stigma surrounding mental health. So uh, between my experiences with her um, in law school, with the system, the child welfare system, um, and, and uh, encouragement to pursue psychoanalytic training uh, so that I could um, really understand what um, uh, may be uh, perhaps a, a very useful tool for dealing with long-term trauma. Mm. Um, something I couldn't really help clients with in the law, right? Uh, when you have an endless river of, of uh, 
of misery flowing through your legal docket mm -hmm. and, and um, uh, really are uh, constantly triaging and placing band-aids on, um, on, on cases. It was more appealing to work in depth mm -hmm. with um, individuals who had been traumatized. And I found that psychoanalytic studies were the most comprehensive in terms of uh, getting um, to these particular types of issues, especially given the focus on developmental psychology and the role of um, the, the forming uh, and formative ego. So um, I, I uh, did uh, take a, um, a short pause from the practice of law and obtained a, um, a degree in clinical psychology, a master's in clinical psychology, and then uh, a, a doctoral degree in psychoanalytic science, yeah. and um, treated uh, patients for a number of years in various contexts, both as in and outpatients, um, and developed a real appreciation for the standards that ought to be used when evaluating patients for the optimal um, treatments at the optimal settings. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, uh, I became more involved just by virtue of um, my um, contact with the mental health community in helping um, providers uh, advocate for access to care for their patients. Mm -hmm. And, and um, uh, primarily through the administrative appeals process that is um, kind of part and parcel of the commercial healthcare system uh, that that is again run by managed care, mm. and and then slowly um, uh, integrated my skill set in law with my training in in mental health and and formed a mental health law practice. Very cool. It's a lovely amalgamation of your experiences. Um, well, and thank you so much for, for doing that. I, I'm especially thankful for what I've learned about um, with this recent WIT versus uh, the, the giant um, insurance corporation of uh, United Behavioral Healthcare, uh, that the work you've done on that. I was curious if you could share a little bit, of, like a, I know it's probably um, enormous and and very very much in depth. Could you share a, a brief summary of what your experiences on that case uh, have been like, and and how you see that fitting into our context right now? Sure. So I um, uh, kind of again, having uh, been trained in in both disciplines, was able to um, unearth the defects in United Behavioral Health's medical necessity criteria for determining um, uh, level of care placement for patients and um, had come across many cases where um, outpatient psychotherapy at any frequency beyond once a week was rationed on the basis that um, such services were only suitable if they were to prevent hospitalization, for example, mm -hmm. or when uh, residential treatment was uh, denied um, unless a patient was in some sort of imminent crisis. And, and I um, knew that the standards that UBH developed for assessing which patients it was going to um, approve treatment for uh, were flawed. Uh, I, I knew that the um, sources, the primary sources that UBH pointed to um, in its um, guidelines were not um, followed and, and that this had largely gone on uh, uh, for a very long time without any type of intervention. So I was able to uh, forge a uh, very uh, meaningful and special alliance with um, so a group of excellent attorneys that I, I uh, work with. And uh, together we were able to initiate a class action lawsuit that challenged the medical necessity guidelines that were used by this insurer to um, 
improperly deny care. And um, these guidelines were used between the years 2011 to 2017. So it was a very lengthy period of time. Uh, there were, I believe, over 60,000 denials in this class um, that consisted of people who sought uh, treatment for, again, outpatient therapy, um, for uh, higher levels of care, like intensive outpatient treatment or residential treatment. And obviously these are levels of care, not modalities of treatment. Mm -hmm. The, the um, common denominator here was that UPH was essentially uh, limiting care only to acute short-term episodes. And uh, we all know that, that um, uh, that's just not gonna cut it for a majority of, of, of patients um, uh, who have chronic needs. Uh, who have um, uh, co-occurring disorders, uh, complex psychopathologies that aren't amenable to short-term interventions. Mm -hmm. So um, for the chronic, chronically ill population, um, uh, that's uh, subjecting them to standards that uh, UBH created was just patently unreasonable. Mm -hmm. And um, we were able to take this case uh, through uh, trial and prevail mm -hmm. um, and obtain some excellent remedies as well uh, as, as recently as this past November. So um, uh, it's a case that really uh, stands out because um, not, not, not only because of, of the size of the class that's, that's at issue, mm -hmm. uh, but also because um, it really addresses what the generally accepted standards of care are for making um, patient placement determinations in the mental health and substance use context. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, UBH, like most insurers around the country, um, was bound to approve coverage um, based on standards that comported with generally accepted professional um, uh, practice, but in reality, uh, and, that, and that was because the insurance policies that it administered required that as um, part of their um, uh, medical necessity uh, uh, expectation. Mm -hmm. but, but regrettably, UBH imposed standards, these acuity-based standards, uh, crisis-based standards that were far more stringent than, than what um, the insurance policies actually required UBH to do. So um, th that's, that's relevant because again, most insurance policies around the country define medical necessity to mean uh, services that are among other things consistent with generally accepted standards of care. Mm -hmm. and, and the UBH case, the WIT case highlights um, uh, what those standards are and um, sets um, an expectation that uh, the industry uh, follow the standards. If providers have to follow them, then so should the industry, the, the managed care industry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I hope I answered your question about WIT in a, in a reasonably uh, coherent uh, fashion. Yes, I'm, I'm following. I'm, I guess I'm, I'm digesting uh, the, the work that you that you described and how how many kind of um, elements I imagine must have been involved in, in trying to um, move this through I guess I'm most struck by the uh, the standards of care that you uh, you mentioned came out of the case uh, I, when I was reading up a little bit on uh, the the the, um, the ruling I think uh, I actually took a, a note I wanted to read. Uh, Judge Sparrow mentioned uh, in the ruling that's generally accepted standard of care that effective treatment requires treatment of individuals underlying condition and is not just limited to the alleviation of individuals current symptoms um, and also effective treatment of mental health and substance abuse disorders include services uh, needed to maintain functioning uh, or prevent deterioration. Um, I, I guess I was curious for you, uh, do you have any, 
what is your thought on like the most impactful part of the, the judge's ruling uh, as far as uh, how it will impact mental health care, not just uh, in, in the state that it, was, um, that it was ruled, but like, do you see this moving outside of the state? Where do you think this will go next? So the, the Witt case is actually a, a national case. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry, okay. In that um, uh, United Behavioral Health is a mental health administrator for um, the, the United Healthcare Family Plans. And, mm -hmm. um, and so as such, uh, the, the case really covered, um, like I said, over 60,000 individuals from right. across the country. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and, and so, uh, it will already, ha it already has mm -hmm. uh, some national reach because um, as, as part of, of the remedies, the court ordered uh, United to cease from using its own uh, guidelines and to apply those that are developed by nonprofit clinical specialty associations uh, that don't have a profit motive mm -hmm. to um, unnecessarily uh, curtail care. Um, and so, so uh, that is something that uh, UBH is now required to adhere to for at least a 10 year period. Mm -hmm. um, and and um, under the oversight of a special master and, and uh, that's going to have implications for not just the people who are part of the class, but for the entire commercial um, um, space that UBH operates in. In other words, it has to now make determinations on a going forward basis for all of its commercially insured plan members um, according to the same criteria. And that's going to dramatically expand access to care uh, because they have to follow criteria that are not focused um, with such emphasis on acuity and crisis. Uh, as we all know, uh, the, the, the goal of treatment is not just to uh, allay crisis, it's to, um, as Judge Spiro pointed out, address underlying uh, psychopathology um, and, and uh, prevent deterioration, make it so that a patient doesn't get to a place of crisis so that they're then seeking um, treatment. Um, and, and only for that window of time. Uh, and as we all know, most mental health disorders uh, and substance use disorders are chronic. Uh, they're not uh, a one-time uh, episode. I mean, it, it certainly can be that uh, some are, but the majority aren't. And, and so um, the fact that uh, the largest insurer in the country has to now play fair by using the right standards um, is, is uh, I think, a dramatic move forward uh, nationally. Mm -hmm. uh, every other healthcare insurer has taken note of this case because they're all at risk if they don't follow generally accepted standards of care. Uh, a number of, of uh, insurers have already switched criteria mm -hmm. um, as a result of the suit. And, and um, various states are at various stages of adopting uh, legislation targeting um, uh, standards of care within or, or among all insurers that operate in their jurisdictions. So for example, California um, in late September passed um, Senate Bill 855, which um, created a statewide definition of medical necessity for mental health disorders and also required the use of nonprofit clinical specialty guidelines um, uh, for making level of care placements. Mm -hmm. So that means that all insurers that operate in California and just about all insurers, all major insurers operate in the state. It's a, it's a large, it's the largest market in the country. Mm -hmm. um, uh, all of these uh, insurers are going to be required to play by the same rules so that uh, this is really going to streamline um, the process by which patients, uh, providers, and insurers can communicate with each other. If everyone is on the same page mm -hmm. uh, about what, what appropriate standards apply, then, then it's going to be, I think, a much more 
um, streamlined process in terms of getting services covered. Mm -hmm. um, and and um, uh, I can tell you that New York is also uh, undertaking some uh, examination of the medical necessity criteria used by insurers in that state. So that, and, and, and it's picking up interest in other states too. So the, the Witt case really catalyzed uh, the, the revolution in this field. Wow, far reaching and uh, apologies for um, not recognizing initially that it was national, um, but wow, really it, far reaching implications. It, it's a very dense matter. So I, I, I wouldn't blame you for that. <laughs> I, you know, and I'm curious too, do you feel like the kind of loopholes or circumvention around, you know, parity or um, uh, medical necessity, do you feel like that happens more frequently in mental health or, or also in physical health or physical medicine as well? So it's much easier to um, uh, derail um, uh, mental health treatment if you're an insurer than um, some other forms of treatment that have a more physical basis or, or presentation or manifestation. If you take a blood test and you get a certain result, then you can extrapolate more easily that someone needs X, Y, or Z treatment. Mm -hmm. uh, in the mental health context, uh, when um, uh, we're dealing generally with psychic sy symptoms, but of course they can lead to all sorts of physical impairments and medical comorbidities. Mm -hmm. um, nonetheless, it's, it, it is an easier territory to exploit um, if you're not really in it for the right reasons. Mm -hmm. And again, we are in um, an environment where healthcare is, is not a right in this country. It's a benefit mm -hmm. um, that is largely provided by the employment sector. Uh, but but not exclusively. In any event, it's essentially managed by for-profit corporations that uh, uh, seem to operate with the rule that the house always has to win. Mm -hmm. um, and if the house always has to win, that means that that means that premium dollars come in and stay there. Um, and and uh, certainly in areas like mental health, it is much easier to. Uh, say, well, I don't see X, Y, and Z manifesting, uh, and therefore that must mean that you don't need A, B, or C. Mm -hmm. And, and um, uh, so I, I do believe that um, it is an area where there is much more potential for um, uh, abusive behavior by managed care. Yes. Mm -hmm. Understood. Another thing I've, I've been uh, gnawing on a little bit is the idea that the, you know there has been research, uh, recent research, and also research spanning back, I think through the the eighties at least, that um, has demonstrated that mental health care, um, treating uh, mental health disorders specifically, but also mental health care in conjunction with treating medical disorders like cancers and and that kind of thing, has demonstrated a kind of like a cost savings, uh, so that. It, it kind of um, uh, improves work functioning or decreases the number of hospitalizations or emergent uh, responses uh, and medical responses. So in some ways, the way I'm reading that research or uh, taking it in is that it, it would actually seem that mental health care, uh, um, uh, reimbursing mental health care would actually save uh, insurance companies' money in some way. I, I'm curious, with that in mind, why do you think that's not not the case, or does not seem to be the case? Well, it, it's complicated, but my sense is that in the context of behavioral healthcare, um, again, many of the insurers or companies in the field are carve outs, so they are not necessarily operating in tandem with the um, medical side of the house. Uh, and so it's kind of um, uh, a troll guarding its own bridge, so to speak. Hmm. Um, uh, if, if a carve out has to justify its existence by virtue of saying, look at how much money I saved you, it may not be as incentivized then to say, uh, well, 
uh, I actually didn't send, save you all that much money on my side of the house, but I reduced expenses on the medical side. So it, it really depends on how much integration there is between um, a uh, behavioral health um, uh, or managed care organization and a medical uh, managed care organization. Mm -hmm. Are they really communicating with each other um, and able to uh, rely on aggregate data um, to, to, to be able to um, come to terms with, with exactly what you described, which is lots of data showing that actually spending um, uh, on mental health care uh, can dramatically lower medical costs, especially ER visits, which are prohibitively expensive. Uh, and on top of that, um, not really the best way to deal with um, chronic disorders mm -hmm. uh, on the mental health side. So, so yes, um, uh, you are absolutely correct. There is a good deal of information to support the claim that you made. Uh, but regrettably, I, I think that as long as we have carve outs or companies that are incentivized to um, kind of uh, um, credit or, or uh, 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 su not support, but, but um, it, it essentially prove the value of their existence, I think um, they, Again, I, 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 I haven't studied this directly, but my, my sense tells me that there, there would be a lot of incentive to look at short-term cost savings by saying, look at how much we were able to deny and therefore save, nice. as opposed to approve and save with respect to medical services. I see. Interesting. It kind of, it, so just, I want to share what I'm hearing just to be sure I'm understanding it, but it, it almost sounds like you're saying that the because things are so disconnected, different, like the carve outs are so disconnected from the kind of parent company and that may be disconnected, like medical and behavioral health might be disconnected. Um, so think it, with a lack of streamline in understanding the costs, where the costs are going, um, there's, there's no communication there. And it, it's, that's where the ball is. Or, or if there is a failure of communication, it would certainly support or lend uh, credence to the theory that that um, uh, that managed behavioral health organizations are looking to um, essentially cut costs in the short term, mm -hmm. um, since since they're not necessarily looking at the big picture. I see what you mean. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. Okay. Uh, well, thanks for sharing that. And I'm I'm curious too. What do you if what do you kind of dream as um, what's next? Uh, how do you see that? I, I've certainly heard about the broad reaching implications of this uh, WIT versus UVH case. Do you have a dream about what might come next um, if, you, if you could? Well, I, I would love to see um, uh, adoption by uh, federal statute of um, uh, some of the findings in the WIT case. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that all policies across the country are subject to, um, uh, again, similar standards when it comes to mental health care, mm -hmm. so that you don't have to worry about uh, whether you're purchasing insurance from one insurer or another. You'll know that if you need care for a particular condition, uh, you, will, you will have it covered mm -hmm. um, under any um, arrangement uh, with, with whatever insurer you, you choose. So I would love to see, um, again, the, the generally accepted standards of care that were articulated by the WIT court um, incorporated into federal legislation. Um, I, I um, uh, would, I, I think that would be a major kind of uh, achievement, mm -hmm. uh, but certainly in, just as important to have those standards and um, a kind of, uh, other, other components uh, related to the provision of services like network adequacy, um, 
become part of um, more of a mainstream, nationally unified system. Mm. Uh, so, for example, medical necessity is just one factor, although very significant factor, that limits people from getting access to care. Mm -hmm. But another um, major impediment is um, lack of suitable networks. So um, uh, the inability to access care because um, patients can't get providers to see them, uh, oftentimes because there aren't enough providers on network panels and people can't afford to pay out of pocket for out of network care. So there's got to be a system in place that can address the um, uh, issue that arises when a patient uh, needs care but doesn't have where to turn to. Mm -hmm. um, again, that's something that the Senate bill that I helped uh, write in California addresses, um, requiring the uh, managed care industry to allow patients to access out-of-network care when in-network services are not available and making sure that patients are not held to any greater co-share than what they would pay uh, were they seen on an in-network basis. I see. Uh, so th that's, that's what I would call um, a network access issue. And I think that that is um, also extremely important to address. Mm. Uh, no, I don't want to suggest that WIT was about network adequacy. It was not a case uh, addressing that issue. Mm -hmm. But if you were to ask me what I would like to see, mm -hmm. then I, I think uh, my ideal scenario would entail having the uh, WIT standards become um, incorporated into federal law throughout the country with respect to all insurers, uh, and then also um, requiring very specific network adequacy um, standards that address timeliness of care, mm. uh, geographic distance, and uh, suitability. In other words, not every provider is equipped to handle um, all, all patients. Some uh, psychotherapists, for example, are only versed in, um, uh, for example, CBT or short-term treatments, and they are not the suitable um, uh, provider type for patients seeking um, longer term treatments or uh, psychodynamic modalities mm. uh, that that are better suited for certain types of psychiatric presentation. So um, uh, it's essential to um, expand network adequacy standards uh, across the, the country. Some states have done a better job than others. Um, some states have articulated them, but aren't enforcing them. Mm -hmm. And um, self-funded plans subject to federal law aren't at all um, uh, necessarily um, told what network adequacy standards to follow unless specific health plans direct them to. So um, there's a lot to be done in that realm. But I would say these two are, are major, major uh, areas of focus for me and, and um, my practice. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I, what I hear with that second piece that you added was the, um, it almost, it sounds to me almost putting the, maybe the burden uh, or the responsibility of ensuring that your network is, uh, has uh, a suitable number of clinicians, but also clinic, a variety of treating clinicians who can treat a variety of-, of um, And who are available within a timely and geographic Set of parameters, right. not on a wait list for months and months. And Correct, and and uh, again, that's um, uh, critical. Oftentimes, we see that um, the networks are deficient because insurers underpay mm -hmm. um, if they were to offer more reasonable reimbursements and subject providers to less uh, or fewer uh, intrusions. Um, uh, such as by requiring concurrent reviews of, for example, outpatient therapy, mm -hmm. then, then we would have a more incentivized group of people willing to participate in networks. Mm -hmm. But as long as insurers continue to devalue uh, psychotherapy and uh, to uh, devalue mental health clinicians, and to, on top of that, intrude on their treatments and second-guess their 
um, clinical judgment, then we're going to have greater resistance to working um, within uh, network panels. And, and uh, uh, that's something that should not ultimately be the patient's fault. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, the patients pay premium dollars to receive insurance coverage and they expect to be treated um, uh, accordingly. And, mm -hmm. and I think that the insurance industry has done um, mental health patients a great disservice thus far. Hmm. Understood. As we talked a little bit about your dream of what you would, would um, want to see happen, I'm curious if you have any cautions or um, things to, to keep a, a lookout for of, uh, of I, I guess, things we should keep in mind as we move forward. Um, well, uh, don't underestimate the lobbying power of the insurance industry. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, you're talking about very deep pocketed players um uh but but um i think i think i'm actually optimistic i think um that that we can expect um uh mental health concerns to be taken more seriously by um uh, government officials and regulators uh so uh, I think that that's that's good, um, but but um, I think that everybody needs to stay alert to the issues that were raised in the Witt case and that arise from um, uh, again patients not having access to timely and um, geographically accessible care, mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, until these issues are resolved, we're going to stay um, in in regrettably a crisis mode when it comes to mental health services in this country. Yeah. And um, it doesn't need to be that way. Yes. Yes. Uh, well, I, I know we're, we're getting closer to our time, but I, I want to check in with you. What, what are you working on now? Anything exciting or interesting for you? Well, uh, <laughs> we're working on a variety of, of uh, 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 policy and litigation matters. Um, most of them, again, addressing these um, unresolved issues with respect to medical necessity and network adequacy, mm -hmm. provider reimbursement. Um, all of these fall under um, various aspects of, of um, uh, either federal or state law. Um, and and um, uh, I, I think there are at least, I don't know, between five to to 10 class actions that um, I'm involved in at the moment. Um, and, and again, working with provider groups and um, consumer organizations to um, alert them as to what steps they need to take in order to get the right laws and policies in place that will shape how people are treated in this country when it comes to mental health services. Wow, yeah. So there's a lot on the plate. Um, uh, but I think generally with the same flavor as what we've talked about. Um, awesome. Yeah. Sure. Well, wow. Hearing about what's on the plate for you, I'm especially thankful for your, your time today and, and your work with Cyan as well. I, I really appreciate, appreciate that. Uh, my pleasure. All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Bendette, um, and we'll connect soon. Thank you.